great. I'm actually gonna eat one of these right now because I'm kinda hungry. As an African-American, our history is not a great one. A lot of our history and our customs were erased when we were enslaved. So we were kind of forced to create our own. You gave us lemons and we made the best daggone lemonade to go with our greens, smoked meats, rice and beans, and cornbread, and essentially creating what is like the African-American heritage diet of soul food. Um, I was raised on a version of soul food and I feel like most African Americans were, especially anyone from the South. It was not an uncommon place for my grandmother to, um, summon me into the kitchen and shove fat back down my throat just to, you know, make sure that it was salty enough. Today we will be speaking with Adrian Miller and he is the author of the book Soul Food, the surprising story of an American cuisine, one plate at a time. And the president's kitchen cabinet, the story of African-Americans who have fed our first families from the Washingtons to the Obamas. So without further ado, um, let's go ahead and give him a call up. All right, man, it is so great to have you on our show. Can you please tell us um, a little bit more about yourself and who you are? Yeah, so I'm Adrian Miller. I call myself the Soul Food Scholar. Who is dropping knowledge like hot biscuits? That's my tagline. And uh, um, I used to be a re- an attorney, um, but then I worked in the Clinton White House on something called the Initiative for One America. I was the deputy director of that for a couple of years at the very end of President Clinton's uh, second term. And then I worked at a progressive think tank in Colorado for a little bit, about six years. And then I worked for Colorado's Democratic governor after that. Uh, and then I. Um, and I, then I went into my current job after taking a time off to write the book on soul food. My current job is the Colorado Council of Churches. I'm the executive director of that organization. It's a religious social justice organization. The idea is to get Christian churches to get to know each other across denominational lines and come together to do social justice work. So I, I'm the first African-American and the first lay person to have that job. Okay, so what inspired you to write your first book, Soul Food, The Surprising Story of the American Cuisine? So, yeah. So uh, the short answer is unemployment, um, but I'll give you the longer answer. So uh, I had just uh, come out of the Clinton administration because uh, as at the end of a presidential administration, and um, I, I was going back and forth between whether to stay in D.C. or come back to Denver, and... Um, I was watching way too much television, daytime television, so I just said, you know, I should read something. So I went to a local bookstore, and on the bookshelf was a uh, book called Southern Food at Home, On the Road in History, written by a man named John Edgerton, uh, who has since died. But um, I picked up that book, and the book said the tribute to African-American achievement in cookery has yet to be written. Be written. So with no qualifications at all, except for eating a lot of soul food and cooking it some, uh-huh. I decided to dive in. And what did the journey of writing this book look like? Because you kind of like paint that picture for us. Right. So I, I, I had a day job, so I had to do all of this stuff kind of after hours and on weekends. So I felt like a grad student. But um, I read about 3,000 interviews of formerly enslaved people um, and their reminiscence of uh, their childhood and early adulthood uh, while being enslaved. Um, and I looked for just food references, you know, any, anything, any reference to food um, I wove in. Uh, and try to read and just see what um, that would do for the narrative. Then I read about 500 cookbooks, uh, not only soul food cookbooks, but cookbooks about Southern food and American food in general, just to get a context for how soul food was um, developing over time. Um, I read innumerable newspaper, magazine articles, interviewed a lot of people. And then because I cared about my subject so much, I decided to eat my way through the country. So I went to, uh, yeah, I went to 150 soul food restaurants in 35 cities and 15 states. Um, and if you're my Facebook friend, I brought you along for the ride because I take a picture of the restaurant's exterior and the plate of food. But I hit Philadelphia pretty hard. I was really surprised by the uh, influence of black Muslims um, on the soul food scene. So, you know, a lot of those soul food joints didn't have pork. It was the first place where I ever had a smothered turkey chop. So can you give us a brief history of soul food, where it came from, how it originated, and and kind of, I guess, why it kind of existed? Yeah, so soul food is one of the earliest cuisines. It's a fusion of West Africa, Western Europe, and the Americas. And so soul food um, really started in the 
antebellum South, the plantation culture, where um, Europeans tried to con control uh, the foods that African uh, enslaved Africans ate and then later enslaved African Americans and often forced European foods on them um, and through the rationing process. But then um, in many instances, the enslaved Africans were allowed to grow their own food. And so they did what any other immigrant group does. I mean, although this is a forced immigration context, they tried to recreate home, and food is often a way to do that. So depending on the climate, if they could grow the kinds of foods that they had back at home, they would do that. And um, But in many cases, they had to substitute what they could get that was the closest approximation. So the bitter greens of Europe, you know, collards and kale, mustard, turnip, you know, those things were somewhat similar to the bitter leaves that they um, ate at home, or at least remind, had enough uh, a reminder of that taste. Uh, the types of fish that they ate, raising chickens. Um, now, the new thing was pork, because they didn't really have pork in West Africa. But that was a cheap source of meat, so that became a dominant um, protein, especially for people in landlocked areas. So, um, you, so you've got the kind of slavery narrative, and then as we emerge from emancipation, you've got the onset of this sharecropper system, which essentially, uh, although African Americans were free to grow more stuff and, and had a little more freedom, the the oppression of the sharecropping system and the perverse incentives really started to bring in processed food into the diet um, because mm -hmm. um, you had a plot of land, right? You could grow whatever you wanted to, but your incentive was to grow as much of the commodity crop as you could because you often entered that situation um, either uh, owing a lot of debt or, you know, you just need to borrow and get uh, advanced financing to have the equipment, seed, fertilizer, all that stuff that's necessary for farming. So if your incentive is to use every a plot of land to grow the commodity crop, you're going to start going to a nearby store and just using that for your food instead of growing fresh ingredients. And it just mm -hmm. so happened that the former masters of the plantation is now called landlords, the ones really still pulling the strings, they created this commissary store on the land in the plantation for the uh, sharecroppers to shop. And, uh, you know, that, that landlord controls basically the accounts. There was a lot of, you know, bad dealings and all kinds of stuff. So essentially it was, the whole setup was to keep African Americans in, in um, a, you know, in debt. And eventually so many people got sick of the system that they fled the South and went to other parts of the country. And I think that is the critical part of the soul food story mm -hmm. because – I argue in my book that soul food is really the cuisine of these black migrants who left the South and settled in other parts of the country. And just to elaborate a little bit, if you look at soul food, it's a hybrid of celebration food and everyday food. And that celebration food is the stuff that's most notable, the fried chicken, mm -hmm. the biscuits, the, you know, the glorious cobblers and the cakes. And so, uh, again, just like the uh, African immigrants from West Africa – African Americans who went to other parts of the country tried to recreate the rural South, at least in terms of the food. And um, often they were growing their own food or ship, getting it shipped or, you know, borrowing from their neighbors, learning and applying different tricks. And so that's where we really see soul food come together as a cuisine. Because inside the South, they don't really call it soul food. I mean, it's called country cooking, home cooking, or Southern food. It's really outside the South that the distinctions between Southern and Seoul really start to sharpen. So where do you see soul food going next? So I would say right now, soul food's in kind of a postmodern state. You've got the traditional. You've got the efforts to make it healthy, down-home healthy. Mm -hmm. You've got vegan. Um, you, you got, you've got kind of upscale soul food where you take, uh, you know, you take the traditional soul food but add refined ingredients or um, expensive, exotic ingredients. And I would say that right now, vegan is probably the hottest trend in soul food. Okay, so so basically, vegan soul food is the next wave? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing about vegan is the beginning and the end of soul food in many ways. Uh, if you actually go back and look at what enslaved people were eating in the antebellum south, it's very close to what we call vegan today because it was seasonal vegetables, 
it was water. Um, and meat, if there was meat, it was really just to season the vegetables somewhat. But it was not a main entree. Uh, and this is a nod to how people ate in West Africa because uh, West African food is very vegetable and seafood based. And in many cases, dried fish, salted fish or smoked fish were used the same way that smoked and salt pork, uh, smoked pork like ham hocks and salt pork were used to season vegetables. So the things that we think about for soul food, you know, the fried chicken, the barbecue, the cakes and all, that was this once in a while food. Um, the enslaved cooks only got access to that those ingredients maybe on weekends and for special occasions. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times now, um, as a kind of rejection of traditional soul food, vegan is cast as this departure, but it's really a homecoming. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. Okay, that's real powerful. Yeah, because the, the eating vegetables has always been an undercurrent. Or I shouldn't even say an undercurrent. It's always been a mainstay of soul food cuisine. Wow, man, that that is something. I feel like I'm learning so much right now. Um, so we're getting down to the end of it. And we like at the end of the interview to do a thing where we um, ask for our interviewee to have a self-care tip of the week. Do you have anything like that you would like to share with our audience? Anything that you've done in your travels? Oh, yeah. So first of all, I would say eat more soul food in this sense. If you listen to what dietitians are telling us to eat, right, more dark leafy greens, more sweet potatoes, more hibiscus, those are all the building blocks of soul food. So, um, you know, it's all about how it's prepared. So if you steam the vegetables, um, maybe do different preparations that get away from the traditional frying and other things, you know, that will do your body a lot of good. Um, the other thing is just to make sure you slow down every day and just be mindful. Um, hmm. Some people do meditation. Some people do prayer. But, you know, it's in this interconnected world where we're always on the go. It just takes, it, it really helps to just slow down for a minute. And um, this is from, these are the words of Joseph Campbell, the guy who was a mythology expert. Um, I remember seeing him, hearing him say this on an interview he did with Bill Moyer a few years ago. But, you know, find your bliss if you can well, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Please, please, please tell people where they can find you and where they can find the rest of your works. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, please follow me on social media. For most platforms, my handle is Soul Food Scholar, and that is uh, my handle for Twitter and for Instagram. Um, I have a Soul Food Scholar fan page on Facebook. And my website is soulfoodscholar.com for the soul food. And then I have a Black Chef's White House.com for the president's book. Yeah. The first, my first book is Soul Food, The Surprising Story of, of an American Cuisine, One Plate at a Time. Uh, it's available now in paperback. Uh, the, soul, uh, the hard copy is, uh, cover is sold out. Uh, you can get it online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's also available in electronic form. And then my second book is The President's Kitchen Cabinet, the story of the African Americans who have fed our first families from the Washingtons to the Obamas. And that book is available in hardcover right now. It'll be out in paperback this fall. And uh, it is an electronic book as well as an audio book. Uh, you can get it as an audio book on downpour.com. And also, you know, um, I go around the country doing uh, public speaking. So if you have opportunities that you want to hear the stories of the White House Kitchen, or the true story of soul food. I do it in a very entertaining and informative way. So I would love to come to a town near you. All right, guys, that wraps it up for us for this episode of Eat the Right Thing. Um, on next week's episode, we will um, actually be getting into the history of my diet. I actually sat down and interviewed um, both of my parents so I can get some insight on um, how, what kind of diet they raised me, what was their motivations, what was their intent. Um, it's a super, it's, it's a super interesting um, conversation, especially since my parents are divorced. So I don't have them in the same room. So it's actually two separate interviews interviews but it's full of a lot of great content that i think um will be will prove insightful and be very very relatable to a lot of people so um with that being said uh, we are back on schedule um the next episode will be out um in two weeks and 
I look forward to 